I want to take a minute uh, while we're here in the midst of worship, and um, I want us to pray together. Uh, some of you may know we've had a couple of tragedies in our community this weekend, and uh, so we want to pray for the Freeman family on the loss of their daughter, Joy, 17 years old, and the Peacock family. Um, I was with them last night at the hospital, and uh, their daughter accidentally drowned, uh, six years old. And um, the Peacocks are uh, part of this church family here. And so um, I just think it's important that we pray for them. So will you join me? And God, this morning, just as a community of faith, we just want to join our hearts together and pray for these families, the Freemans and the Peacocks, who are struggling. And Lord, we're asking that you would come in to their lives, into their situation right now, and that you would give them your strength and your peace and your mercy. God, that they might know your presence and even feel our prayers right now. God, we pray for friends and family as they come around to support them, that, um, that in their love and care, that they might also sense you there. Lord, we pray that you would just um, help them as they deal with the pain of loss and as they grieve. And Lord, there's no, there's no words for this and there's no easy answers. But God, at the end of the day, we just trust you. We believe that you are Lord of all, that you know the beginning and the end, that you know the, the whole picture of life and that your purpose and your plan are perfect. And at the end of the day, we submit to that and we trust you even when we're left with questions here. But God, we know that your strength is real and that your presence is evident and we thank you for it and for walking with families like this through difficult moments. So we lift them up to you this morning. And we ask now that as we open your word, that as we read your truth, that you would come and you would, you would once again reveal yourself to us here. That we might know you, be closer to you, understand who you are, and the relationship that we share with you. And so God, we invite you into this place this morning, that you would just come and help us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You have a seat. And I just ask that you just continue to keep these families in your prayers this week. Um, it's just going to be a very difficult week. And, and you know, I just think about the school starting and uh, a lot of college students are rolling into town. And uh, just to remember them in your prayers as well. And little kindergartners who will be going off to school and parents who will be emotional and all those kinds of things are going to be happening this fall. And, and uh, so we just uh, we want to pray for certainly for families and even this morning, I've, I've seen uh, a lot of new faces. So if you're new with us today, we just want to say uh, welcome. We appreciate you coming. And I know we've got even some parents in town who are dropping off their college student. And uh, so we are grateful for you being here with us. And uh, we just think about your student as they go back to school. And, and uh, we will remember them as well. And uh, we'd love to be a home for them here. And also just uh, three services coming up next Sunday. That's a big change for us. Um, Always creates a lot of fun confusion here as people show up at all kinds of random times for church. But pretty much if you just show up between 8 and 11, you're going to get church at some level. So just come on and, uh, and you'll make it and it'll be good. Um, but I appreciate y'all's patience as we do that and make some changes around here. This morning, we're going to continue in this series that uh, we just called Encounters. And if you're dropping in with us, we've been looking at these, these events, these moments in the Bible when people encountered Jesus. And we know that every time it happened, some truth was revealed, some, uh, something was understood, you know, somebody was left with something to think about. And, 
And, uh, and the truth that was shared in that day is just as real for us today. And so we're going through and just looking at those kind of one at a time. And, and uh, this morning we're going to take a look at, um, at another one here in just a minute. But before I get there, let me ask you a question. Have you seen this movie, A Few Good Men? You know, it's been out for a long time. So, you know, Tom Cruise, uh, Jack Nicholson. Tom Cruise is this uh, military lawyer and, and uh, he is a prosecutor. And Jack Nicholson is the colonel of this Guantanamo Bay military unit down in Cuba. And, and there's been a death and they've been investigating this death. And Tom Cruise suspects Jack Nicholson. And he's like, I know that somehow he's involved in this deal. And so they put him on the witness stand because if they can just get him to admit something related to it that they'd have him. And so that's the big challenge is trying to, to get him to admit it. You, you probably already know where I'm going with this. But anyway, so at one point, Tom Cruise, uh, he's getting really close and, and he's trying to drop the hammer on him. And he says, I want the truth. And what does Jack Nicholson say? Yeah. You've all seen this movie or you've heard about it anyway. Yeah, you can't handle the truth. And you remember why he says that. He begins to do this long explanation after that where he says, listen, you don't want to know the truth of how we have to handle things down in Guantanamo Bay. You know, we, we have to do things that are hard and difficult and we run our operation a little different, but we do that because we live a mile from a gun that's pointed at us every day. You know, we do that because we're the threat of the enemy every single day and, and we do things to keep you safe while you're warm in your bed at night. You know, he goes to this whole long thing about you can't handle the truth because you really don't want to hear about it. You wouldn't want to hear how that, that happens. And, you know, as I, I watch that movie, and I've seen it over and over again, I think about that idea just you can't handle the truth. And, you know, when I think about the truth in terms of the big T truth, the truth of life, or maybe the truth about us, sometimes we're not, maybe we don't handle the truth as, as good as we could. Maybe sometimes if the truth shows something about our life that's not good, we don't want to hear the truth. If somebody speaks the truth to us, sometimes we don't want to hear that uh, when it might be, a little bit painful to hear, but we know that it's right. Uh, and sometimes the world in general just doesn't want to know the ultimate truth about God. But there is a truth, a truth that we need to know and that we need to understand. And, and so really that's the essence of this encounter today is this whole idea of truth. And it's the exchange between Jesus and Pilate. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 18, uh, verse 36 through 38. John chapter 18, starting there in verse 36. Uh, just a little background to kind of lead up to this exchange. Jesus has been arrested. Uh, he is starting his journey to the cross. Uh, the high priest has uh, sent out his soldiers to go arrest Jesus. Um, they think they have enough to sort of convict him on. And, and uh, they take him to Caiaphas' house, who is the high priest. They question Jesus. They're not satisfied there. And they know that they can't try Jesus and have him killed. But they, if they can get the Roman governor to convict him that that could happen. So they send him over to the Roman governor, who in that day was a guy named Pilate. Now, the deal is Rome has pretty much dominated uh, most of the known world by that day, and they've put outposts in, in many places. So Rome has an outpost there in Palestine or Israel, and every outpost has its own governor. And uh, they're just in charge with keeping the peace and making sure that, that everything's running according to Caesar and to Rome. And and uh, they don't really have a lot to do with religious uh, issues. And so, you know, when this issue comes to Pilate, he's not really sure what to do with it. He really doesn't care, frankly, as long as they're not causing trouble. Because Caesar doesn't like it when there's trouble and when people try to rise up. So he's like, if it looks like that's going to happen, we're going to deal with that. So anyway, so they send Jesus to Pilate. And they say, you need to convict him. He's broken our law. And Pilate's like, what am I going to do to deal with somebody with your law? And they said, well, he keeps claiming to be the king, our king, king of the Jews, and all these kinds of things. And, and so basically they hand it over to Pilate. Pilate starts to question Jesus, and he's, he's like, look, you know, what have you done? And he says, are you the king of the Jews? And this is the response to that question here, in, starting in verse 36. Jesus said, well, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. 
I just want to stop right there. In answering the question, as Jesus is so good at doing, he kind of circumvents, you know, the, the answer more or less. And, but in the answer, we discover Jesus is saying, in a way, I am a king, but it's, it's not like anything you would know. And my kingdom is not like anything you would be familiar with. It's from another world. But in this kingdom, there is a truth. I am the one who has come to testify to the truth. And if you believe in that truth, then you are one of my followers. If you reject that truth, you're not one of my followers. You're not in this kingdom. So in a sense, yes, I am, I am Lord over a kingdom. I am a king in a certain way, but it's the kingdom of truth. And when people line up with that, they're, they're lining up with me. They're following me. They're serving me. And so Jesus is kind of having this whole conversation. And in a way, he's trying to tell Pilate, look, I haven't come to be somebody who starts an insurrection, if that's what you're looking for. I'm not going to start an uprising. I'm not going to make Caesar upset. You know, that's not why I've come is to be that kind of a king. And that was frustrating to Pilate because he really wanted him to say that because then he could convict him. It'd be easy for him. But that's not what Jesus was directly saying. So he's like, I don't know what to get this guy on. And then Jesus starts into this whole thing about, you know, truth. And I'm sure Pilate's like, what are you talking about? What do you mean by that? But in the process, Jesus is, is really disarming Pilate. And you know, the thing is, while Jesus wasn't a threat, the movement that he was starting, it really was a threat to the Roman religion, to the Roman establishment. It was a threat to the Jewish uh, religious establishment of that day. And Jesus was saying, look, in one way, I'm not dangerous. I'm not here to cause trouble. And in another way, what I'm doing is dangerous. <laughs> You'll see one day what I mean by that. It's dangerous. The truth is a threat to leaders who want to control with deceit. For people who want to lord over other people. I mean, think about through our history. Look at Hitler. Hitler lorded over the people with deceit and with power and control. But anytime there is truth that is present, that's a threat to a leader like that. Look at any cult leader. It's the same deal. You know, don't tell the people the truth so that we can control them. And that's how the truth works so often, just in the world. And so this is what Jesus was saying. Look, I have come to be the truth by which people will line up with. And then Pilate, you know, responds with this just timeless question. What is truth? And, you know, if you could just imagine when he said it, the exasperation that he said it with. And we don't know exactly why he even offered this question. Maybe it was because he had not seen any sense of truth in the Roman government. Maybe he'd not seen it in the Roman religion with all the gods that they were to serve. Maybe he'd been on a search for truth and just simply said, I don't see it anywhere in my life. So really, Jesus, what is truth? And he didn't even dwell on the question. Jesus didn't necessarily respond to it. They just kind of move on. And yet there is in this short question and statement, these few words, the timeless question of what is truth that people have been searching for for so long in our history. And you know, I think in this process, as I've said before, sometimes we don't, we don't necessarily want it in a particular way. Sometimes we like it like a pill, you know, that you give your dog or your cat, we wrap it up in ham and cheese and like whipped cream, we put a pickle on top and then we're like, here, just here's the pill, you know. Yeah, just kind of give it to me like that. We want it in a particular way. Um, quick story, there's a husband got a phone call from his wife. She's traveling over in Europe. And she calls him up. She says, hey, how's everything going there at the house? He's like, it's all good. And she says, how's the cat? He goes, dead. And she was like, oh, my gosh. I can't believe that. What happened? And, and by the way, I can't believe you just said it like that. That was so, ins that was just uncaring, insensitive. And, uh, and he's like, well, okay, I don't understand. And she goes, well. Like when I was in Paris, you could have said the cat was on the roof and something happened. And I don't know what's going on there. And then when I got to London, you could have said, oh, something's happened. I've taken the cat to the vet. And when I get to New York, you could have said, I don't think things are good. And then when I got home, you could have said, oh, you know, little Fluffy's passed away. And he's like, okay, I'll try better next time. She goes, all right. And she says, by the way, how's mom? And he says, uh, on the roof. <laughs> I just thought that's pretty funny. Anyway, 
you know, if he could just give it to me along and along in the way that I might like it, that'd be better for me. You know, it's like maybe we just want to take the truth in the way that we want to take it, not in the way that it actually is sometimes. And, and you know, the truth is so uh, applicable just to every part of our life. What is the truth about God? What is the truth about life and death? What is the truth about love and relationship, about tragedy? What is the truth about hope? You know, all these things in life, I mean, really, even if we don't couch it in the way I just said it, that's what we're looking for. You know, we want to know the answers, and we want to know what are we living our life by. Now, there's two terms that oftentimes we use when it comes to the idea of truth, relative and absolute. You know these terms? When we talk about truth that is relative, we're talking about a truth that is relative basically to you and to your experience. So if it's truth for you, that's good. But whatever is truth for somebody else, well, that's good too. Even if we're opposing in our truths, it's all good. And if there was a truth back then, it doesn't necessarily mean that truth has to still be today. It's just relative to whatever time you're in. You see what I'm saying with this? There's a truth that's just relative to everybody. Now, I would say that in this day and age that we live, in the world that we live in, that's kind of how truth is handled. It's just relative. Hey, it's okay with you. It's okay with me. Truth is truth for everybody in the world, you know? And then there's this idea of absolute truth. And basically, it's that if, a, if it's a truth that's good for me, it's good for everybody. If it's true for me, it's true for everybody. If there was a truth back then, then it's still a truth today. It's a truth that whether we believe it, uh, whether we believe it's right or wrong, it's still a truth. And nothing would change that over time. That's what we call absolute truth. And in the world that we live in, I don't think that people really want one. I think we like choices. I just like to pick whatever suits me. And to bring up this idea that there is one truth that everybody would line up against, sometimes that's, that's hard for people to handle. And yet Jesus came and he said, I want you to know that I am, I am the, the one, if you want to talk about that, I am the, the one truth. That's what I've come to testify to. And that's what he was offering. But kind of back to the world we live in, a group named Barna Research did a survey on what Americans believe about this idea. And uh, when they were asked the question, is there absolute truth, 66% of the adults responded that they believe there is no such thing as an absolute truth. Different people can define truth in conflicting ways and it can still be correct. Oh, that was fascinating. 66%, like that's a lot of people. And then they went on in a series of more than 20 interviews conducted at random at a large university. People were asked if there was such a thing as absolute truth. All but one responded along these lines. Truth is whatever you believe. There is no absolute truth. If there were such a thing as an absolute truth, how could we know what it is? And people who believe in absolute truth are dangerous. I thought that was interesting. But you know, in my experience, and I've had a lot of these conversations with people, I mean, you know, just living in a university town, it's going to happen. But it's funny because when you bring that up, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are definitely absolute truths that we all live by, whether we know it or claim it or not. Here's one. What do we call that one? Gravity. You know, that's an absolute truth, I would say. It's pretty much here to stay. Um, you know, when we get on an airplane, we don't sit around and debate the idea if the pilot believes in Bernoulli's principle of flight. You know, it's like, you know, we have faith that that guy knows what he's doing, that he trusts the principle, and the principle is an absolute truth, that it's, you know, the plane's going to get up and that's going to happen. We flip on the light. We don't debate the... Absolute truth of electricity and you don't wonder if that's really real or stuff like that. I mean, that's not a big philosophical argument. You have. Sit down on the chair. We pretty much trust it. You didn't come in today and go, I'd like to debate the absolute truth of this chair holding me up today. I mean, it's like, come on, people. We don't really debate. Though. We don't think about those things, yet they're absolute truths. But when it comes to what's in here, people get all weird. And, they, and they have the questions and the wondering and the, oh, can I really handle that? And can you say that? I mean, can you be so narrow? And, you know, all these kinds of things. And this is where we get stumped. The word in the Bible for true, by the way, is alethes. It means actual, true, or fact. The word truth is alethia. So this is your big Greek lesson for today. You can write this down. It means objectively signifying the reality lying at the basis of an appearance. So now you're in philosophy class. It's, it's like this truth that is a foundational idea that lays at the basis of what might be the appearance of something. It's like we believe in this layer right here. This is the truth of what we see on top of it, so to speak. 
So that's what the Bible, when it talks about this idea of truth, it uses that terminology, real, concrete, the basis for all things, truth. And that's the word that's being used here with Pilate and Jesus. And again, Jesus has come to say, I am that. I am that that you were you. That word you just used, what is truth? I am that. Now for you and I today, what do we do with that? What is the practical application of what is truth? You know, how do we, how do we live this thing out? Well, I think that one aspect of living out this whole idea of truth for us in this world is just the idea of listening. Would you agree with me that there are a whole lot of things being said to you every day, every week, lots of messages on Facebook, lots of messages on TV, lots of books to read, lots of big ideas out there all coming at you, some of which are related to this whole notion of truth, and you're trying to discern what is right and what is not. And there are voices speaking to us. There's a country song out by Chris Young. Any country fans out there? Not too many? Great. I'm up here by myself, but he has a song called I Hear Voices All the Time. And uh, you want me to sing it? <laughs> it ain't going to happen. But anyway, he says, you could be a little bit crazy. You call me insane walking around with all these whispers running around here in my brain and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the whole song is about all these voices that are in his head, basically from people in his past, mom, dad, granddaddy, grandma, somebody who, are, who spoke a word of truth into his life. And now as he's gotten older, he's still hearing that. And when he's going to do something, he's like, well, well wait a minute, I'm hearing that, that voice of my grandma that's telling me, you know, don't do that or, you know, whatever. And, uh, and you know, in a similar way that, that, that happens in our life, not in some weird psycho way. I'm talking about, you know, voices that are the real deal. There's the voice of the enemy. We've heard that one before. The one that tells us to do the wrong thing. The one that tempts us. Um, and then there's the spirit of God, that voice that speaks into us. That's what we call the voice of truth. And that's the one we want to do well by. So here's a few thoughts on that. Number one, as you listen, listen wisely to that voice of truth. Listen wisely to that voice of truth. You know, when Jesus came, he didn't say, I am truthful, although he was. He didn't say, I'm not a liar, although we know he wasn't a liar. He didn't say, I know a lot of things about the truth. He said, I am the truth. In fact, he said it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That statement right there pretty well sums up a lot about this notion of truth. Jesus said it. Look, there is heaven. It's a real deal. There is a life after this life. That's for real. And the only way to get to that life in heaven is through me. There is no other way. He didn't give us an out on that. He didn't say there could be, there might be, there might be another prophet, there might be another leader, there might be another religion or something like that. He said, no. The only way to the Father, the only way to heaven is through me. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. And basically what he was saying was, as you, as you live your life and you hear lots of things, I want you to measure it against me. I am the, you know what a plumb line is? It's that line that you hold up that's perfectly straight and you measure something against that to build with. He's saying, I am the plumb line. And I am perfectly straight. So if you want to know what's truth in your life, measure it against what I've said and what I've done. If you want to know how to live out your marriage well, measure that against what I've said. And if you want to live out your relationship with your friends well, measure that here. Everything you do, you can measure that against me to find out how to live your life and what is right. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, he also said, the truth shall set you free. Every time you come to the truth, you will find freedom. And so every time you come to Jesus, you will find freedom. And he said things like, if you're hungry, I have food that will last forever. If you're thirsty, I have living water. If you're in the dark, I am the light. If you feel dead inside, I am life. Listen wisely to that voice. Also listen carefully to discern the truth. You know what discernment is, where we see two things and we choose the right one, but we need wisdom to know which one to choose. And again, in this life, as we go throughout our day, there's a lot of choices that we make and a lot of opportunities. 
and a lot of voices speaking at one time. And we want to be sure that we're listening carefully to the one truth that Jesus is offering. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.4, 4, he said this. He said, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. He's talking about, you know, one day as we go down this road, Timothy, I need you to pay attention because there are going to be a lots, there, there are going to be a lots of philosophies and theologies and ideas about God and ideas about happiness and all these kinds of things. But I want you to pay attention, Timothy. There's only one truth. Be careful. Many people, even good people, will begin to listen to these myths, to these falsehoods. And they'll be done in by them, but not you. You stay true. And you preach the word. And you offer the truth to people. You stick with that, you're going to be fine. And he was essentially telling him to listen carefully to discern the truth. And another one is just listen intently to the word of truth. You know, when we use that term word, this is what we're talking about right here, this book. The word of truth. Why do we call it the word? Because who's speaking? Who's speaking? God. Through Jesus, sometimes. God is speaking out of this book. And many times people come to Rusty, I'm just not hearing. I can't, you know, I can't, I'm not sure what he's trying to tell me here and whatever. I'm like, have you read this? <laughs> no. Well, you're not going to hear. The words are in here. And you know, the beautiful thing is, God has set this up great that when we read this word, it finds its way to our heart. And how many times have you had something happen and this word come back to your mind? I've heard so many stories of people who grew up on the grandmother's knee, a grandmother who read the Bible to them when they were younger, and then maybe they got away from, you know, Christianity and religion and church and all that kind of stuff, but something happened, something in their life, and grandma, in their mind, in their heart, they hear this word, this scripture coming back in that moment, because you know why? It's stuck. In the Bible, it says the word will not return void. There is this spiritual thing that happens that when the word goes out, it stays and it does its work in us. Like right now on Sunday morning, when we're talking about this word is doing something in you, you may not even realize it. You may not even think about it. But it's so good that God has, has a way of kind of like getting that in and giving it power to change and shape us. In John 17, it says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. That's how we'll be sanctified. And you know, another danger is though, we can take this book and we can um, pick what we like and then do away with the rest. Have you ever read something you didn't like in the Bible? Okay, you don't have to confess. But anyway, there were times in my life where I read things and I went, I just, um, you know, I don't know about that one. I don't know if I like that. In fact, have you ever heard of the Thomas Jefferson Bible? You know what Thomas Jefferson did? He took the Bible, took a razor, and he went through it, and he cut out everything he didn't like, rearranged it so that it sounded better, took all the miracles out because he didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome if we could just make it say what we wanted it to say. It'd be like, oh, my life is awesome. Look at I got the Rusty Bible. It's my whole life laid out right here. But we can't do that. That's not how this works. God has perfectly pieced this thing together to say exactly what we need it to say for us. And I guess the question, though, is are we listening to it? Are we in it long enough to let it speak to us? Billy Graham once said, truth is timeless. Truth does not change from one age to another, from one people to another, from one geographical location to another, people's ideas may differ, their customs may change, their moral codes may vary, but the great all-prevailing truth stands for time and eternity. And that's it. Truth has always been the truth that God brings. So back to Pilate's question, what is truth? Here we go, just wrapping this up. Truth is what is real. Jesus is real. And he reveals the truths of this world. Jesus is truth and what he says is absolute truth. Something that everybody can and should live by. It is our way to life. 
It's the only way to life. All right, you good with that? I'm going to invite the band if they just go ahead and start making their way up here. Um, this point in the service, we just call this our response time. And, uh, you know, I don't want to make this a rote thing that we do every week. Just something that happens and it's just part of what we do and we kind of know it's coming, but we don't really think about it. This is a time that, you know, when we've heard this, there is this thing called responding to it. And I just believe every Sunday that God is talking. And he's trying to offer something. And so we give you this, this moment, this space to, to maybe claim it for yourself. Maybe there's a decision that you need to make today. Maybe there's somebody that you need to go to and clean something up. Maybe offer forgiveness or ask for forgiveness. Maybe, you know, I don't know what that is for you. I just know that we hope that each week when we do this moment, that, you know, you're just taking it in. God, what are you trying to tell me? And then what should I do about it? And then also we pass these plastic buckets and uh, take up the tithes and offerings. And we do that in worship um, uh, because we believe in God as our provider. Because we're saying, God, I trust you more with my money than I trust myself. I believe that you can do more with this than I can do with it. And at the end of the day, you're going to take care of me and I don't worry about that. And so it's a way for us to do that individually, but even collectively as a church, we offer this to him and we say, God, help us continue to do the vision that you've called us to do. And then I usually say something to the guests. And if you're a guest today, normally what I would say is, hey, if you're new, don't feel like you have to give this morning. A lot of our first time guests, um, this is their first time to church. And they don't really understand this part about tithes and offerings anyway. And so we're just like, hey, don't worry about putting any money in there. Um, that's for the rest of us who know what that means and, and to offer that to God. And, and uh, so in a sense, we're kind of offering that for you today. And so um, I just wanted to be clear about this, this moment that we have after each message and just kind of talk about that. And so, uh, but let's pray, all right? So God, we just thank you for um, the fact that you are real, that you sent your only son to die on a cross be raised again for the truth that you love us and that through his death and resurrection our sins are paid for that we find hope in a world that's so often hopeless that we find grace in a world that oftentimes has no grace that we find salvation and that through him and in that salvation we look forward to the day when there's no more death or sorrow or tears or struggle or stress or pain or anxiety and God we thank you that's the truth So Lord, I'm praying for all of us this morning here in this place that, that we would be reminded of that. That we would give our life, our heart, ourself to you. And put our faith in you. That you'll take care of us and give us life everlasting. God, I pray that we would listen carefully in this world to only hear your voice. And to not be swayed or or tricked into believing something that is not good for us. So God, we're thankful for this morning, for who you are, and for what you mean to each of us. In Jesus' name.